So I'm very pleased today uh, to have here uh, Eric Mungatana and, uh, and Jane uh, Mariara. And um, we are going to talk about ecological economics in, in, in sub saharan Africa, uh, which is a wonderful theme. And um, well, Eric is a professor in, the, in, the, um, in the Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And is our, uh, one of our uh, members in the, in the board of the International Society for Ecological Economics, recently elected. And uh, Jane um, is, um, is, is also a professor in the University of Nairobi, but also the executive director of a think tank. Um, it's called the Partnership for Economic Policy, uh, based in, uh, in Nairobi, in, in Kenya. And um, she is also the president of the um, uh, in African Society for Ecological Economics. So I'm very honored that they have accepted the, the invitation to share some ideas here and have a nice conversation. So first of all, thank you very much to both of you. It's a, it's a pleasure to, to talk to you here. And um, now they hope that our conversation will raise interest for ecological economics in, in, in Africa and, and abroad. Um, so first, I think we can start um, talking about um, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, as a region, uh, even though it's, of course, it's a very diverse uh, uh, region. Uh, it shares some, um, some characteristics, some features. Uh, it, it is, for example, a very young uh, region compared to other parts <laughs> of the world. This is, uh, uh, the youth is um, important share of the, the population, right? And, uh, uh, and also many countries in the region have experienced relatively high rates of, of, of population growth as compared to other, to other countries. Um, and of course, it's a extremely uh, diverse in terms of uh, region in, in terms of um, ecosystems and also culture. That's something that shares with uh, uh, Latin America, the, uh, where I live. Uh, but there are also some common problems like, uh, well, very big pressures on, on, on ecosystems, like but the expansion of the agricultural frontiers um, um, and new trade relations, for, for example, with China that are affecting uh, land uses, um, but also a, a, um, a, um, a growth of uh, cities, right? And that is uh, uh, posing some challenges and on water management and and others other problems related to urban expansion. Um, so maybe we can start just uh, uh, talking about the common challenges uh, with regards uh, biodiversity conservation, uh, uh, management of, of of natural resources, and uh, um, 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 social problems as well, and in in the region. So me. Uh, maybe Jane can talk a bit about that. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Rodan, uh, for this opportunity. I'm very honored uh, just to get uh, some time to speak, maybe first about the common problems that we are facing in Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa, and also maybe what we are doing as the African Society for Ecological Economics, uh, maybe more broadly, because uh, some of the things that we must re we, we really look forward to is how uh, the society could contribute towards um, improving uh, the sustainability of our economies, uh, looking broadly at uh, all uh, dimensions of our ecological issues, ecological economic issues, uh, whether you look at it from the uh, interaction between man and the environment, uh, think about uh, biodiversity, think about uh, natural resources, think about uh, indigenous societies, culture, think about uh, maybe gender, 
think about conflicts in Africa and so forth. Uh, but uh, uh, picking from where you have stopped, and I think you have done, you, you've started with a very good um, introduction of uh, the actual problems in, uh, in Africa. I just want to agree with you, or to say that I will not agree more with you, uh, but to say that uh, <clears throat> part of the issues that we have in Africa related to uh, ecological economics also spring from the broader, maybe social socioeconomic uh, issues that we have in the region and because of the interaction between man and the environment or between um, even the living uh, things think about animals, wildlife, livestock, and so forth, interaction with the environment and with man, then it means that what we have as the economic base and uh, the social interaction therein actually uh, play a very big role in uh, in terms of ecological uh, economic resources and uh, um, uh, implications for sustainability. <clears throat> Think about first what you have mentioned, just about the growth uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in recent years, it's actually said that uh, uh, the growth in Africa or in sub-Saharan, sub-Saharan Africa has been growing uh, faster than other regions of the world. But actually, if you look at the growth rate, it's quite a uh, low uh, because uh, it's basically less than 4%, maybe about uh, 3.7, 3.8%. And for such a huge continent or even sub-Saharan Africa, then that growth is not uh, uh, maybe large enough to ensure that uh, the population that we have um, can uh, be catered for in terms of maybe decent living. And uh, we know that uh, uh, slow growth has implications. Of course, the economists will tell us that uh, no rapid growth is the one that has uh, adverse implications on of the, on the environment in terms of the environmental coosnet curve. But we also know that uh, with slow growth, then we don't nearly have enough potential to uh, sustainably exploit the resources that we have. And sometimes um, we also always have maybe what I would call high uh, time preferences, high discount rates, and we tend to overuse our environment because we, we care more about uh, where we are and what we have. Related to this is the high population growth uh, rate in Sub-Saharan Africa, and also maybe in Africa general, very close to the uh, rate of uh, economic growth. Okay, it's a good thing that it's uh, not as high as the rate of uh, economic growth, but uh, with a population growing at almost 3%, again, that's 2.7%, it's actually quite high uh, for the region, especially if you compare with what is happening in Asia and uh, Latin America. And of course, we know that uh, High population growth uh, puts a lot of pressure on the uh, res ecological resources, whether it's uh, uh, natural resources, whether it's uh, um, um, maybe uh, social resources, if you think about it that way, forests, uh, waters, and so forth. Uh, the, we tend to overconsume uh, natural and ecological resources uh, when the population is very large. And uh, this has implications, uh, not just for the sustainability of those resources, but also sometimes induces uh, climate uh, change. And uh, this is something that we really need to think about. And these, uh, these issues I'm discussing are all very well documented. If you look at uh, maybe your work from IMF, World Bank, OECD, uh, you find a, a lot of that. Then we have this then fast growing population uh, amidst through economic growth. Uh, what happens then is that uh, we tend to have very many people who are poor in Africa. In fact, it's estimated that uh, in 2021 alone, maybe about 490 million of the African population was below the poverty line. And also uh, not just poverty, but a lot of inequalities, very high inequalities. Actually, uh, the Gini index, which is an index that is uh, used to measure maybe um, 
the level of inequality in a country, it's estimated to have reached from about 27% uh, in Algeria. Algeria seems to be the rest, an equal country. Sorry, I know Nigeria is in the north, but it's still North Africa, but it's still uh, good to mention. Yet, uh, some of the uh, drivers, countries that are driving growth in Africa, such as South Africa, had the largest uh, level of inequality with a Gini of about 63%. Uh, percent. Um, and of course now, these inequalities and growing inequalities, again, have their own consequences in the, in, in the economy. It doesn't necessarily have to be uh, economic in nature or even environmental, but remember that when you are looking at ecological issues, we are looking at the broader interdisciplinary issues, including gender, including culture, conflicts, and so forth. And one of the things that arises from inequalities is actually a conflict, and conflict has its own implications, as we have seen in some countries uh, in Africa, actually where it's becoming a real uh, mm -hmm. challenge. Related to all this, again, is uh, the rate of urban urbanization in Africa. And I, uh, Rodan, you mentioned that the growth of cities in Africa, uh, because of the population boom, what has happened is that over time, uh, a lot of uh, resources, uh, rural resources are actually being encroached by urbanization, such that you may find where there used to be plantation farming in some areas, these have been converted into cities. Of course, this has a lot of uh, implications, first on uh, carbon um, production, carbon sequestration, because we tend to degrade forests to create room for cities. But problems such as uh, all forms of pollution that you can think about. We think about um, water pollution uh, from urban, uh, from, from, from the industries, think about air pollution, uh, think about solid waste management, which uh, all are all problems which are associated with cities. And of course, there are the social problems that arise from urbanization, think about crime, uh, conflict, and uh, all other forms. But I think uh, rad conversion, radius conversion has been uh, the major uh, problem that has arisen uh, from that. Um, looking at it a bit differently also, I know we did talk about the growth in Africa, through growth in Africa. Uh, there's a paradox in that, most of the African countries or quite a number of African countries are resource rich, okay? Yet uh, they have natural resources. They have maybe oil, some have gas, some have minerals, not to name forests and so forth. But then you find that they are not necessarily uh, rich in spite of this. I think we have what we call the resource cast. But again, it's because uh, if you think about the infrastructure, maybe the institutions, they are not conducive to help these countries exploit uh, the resources they have. And because of that, they end up actually uh, not being able to mine the resources for uh, the benefits uh, that uh, we should actually have. And then finally, uh, maybe uh, I'll talk about maybe the issues to do with climate change. Africa is very vulnerable to climate change uh, in spite of uh, producing very relatively, very little green gas, uh, 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 greenhouse gases. Africa is quite vulnerable to climate change. We do have, um, we, we know we are talking about Sub-Saharan Africa, but even just think about the Sahel. And then Sahel, there's been the desert, but the desert is actually encroaching parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, first due to the effects of uh, climate change, uh, or, uh, climate change, and then uh, there are vagaries of weather, uh, because most of Sub-Saharan Africa uh, depends on uh, rain-fed agriculture, then there are implications because uh, with the weather patterns changing, uh, with uh, maybe a lot of droughts, uh, sometimes a lot of flooding, uh, there are implications for resource use, there are implications for degradation, a lot of soil degradation sometimes, um, and this um, has uh, adversely impacted on uh, the countries in Africa. 
So as I close, uh, maybe I see those as a major problems, but again, looking at interdisciplinarity, I will not want to forget maybe to say that uh, in the region, there are other issues that you fight that have implications for ecological economics. For instance, if you think about gender disparities, and uh, gender disparity is a major issue. And uh, remember that uh, women and girls are always very vulnerable to uh, environmental and natural resource degradation, including climate change effects, because these are, for instance, the segments of the population that have to spend a lot of time looking for water and firewood. So when resources are degraded, they have to uh, use most of their productive time actually uh, looking for these resources. You can, we, I think I've mentioned something about culture. Uh, indigenous communities have always been best suited to uh, preserve their environments. And I think uh, we knew that from the beginning, uh, maybe when you are talking about the commons, but now it's no longer the same because our cultural, uh, I mean, indigenous communities have kind of been uh, infiltrated by modernity. And with that, uh, there are issues that actually have ecological implications. And finally, I talked about conflict. Africa is in conflict. Every other day uh, you hear, oh, there's conflict in Ethiopia, there's conflict in Burkina Faso, there's conflict in Guinea, there's conflict in the Congo. What uh, happens to ecological economics in time, times of crisis? We know that uh, there will be poor resource governance and uh, uh, whether it's environmental resources, whether it's um, um, economic resources, but really what happens is that uh, in times such as that, then we really have unsustainable uh, consumption and preservation of resources. Thank you. I will take a break there. I can come back and uh, speak some more. Great, uh, Jane. Thank you very much for this very nice overview uh, of a very complex and diverse situation, of course, because uh, it's a huge region and, and um, very diverse, so it's difficult to generalize. But but I, I think we ha you have pointed uh, uh, um, uh, some common problems uh, 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 across uh, different uh, countries and. Um, so um, and, and um, particularly um, because I live in Brazil and uh, um, is um, I think South Africa and Brazil are among the most unequal countries in the in the world uh, and um, so I I'm, I'm interested in, in this issue of, of of inequality and social inequality the relationship between social inequality and um, environmental problems. And I would like to ask uh, Eric about that, and uh, <laughs> because you know that there was a big, big expectation after the end of apartheid in in uh, in South Africa that inequality will be reduced uh, by, um, by by you know uh, uh, progressive governments, but um, I'm not sure that that, that happened. So, <laughs> and um, I would like to ask you. Uh, uh, about the evaluation, I mean, what what has happened during the, these past uh, thirty years, and um, it, to what extent inequality has been reduced or not, and how is it related to to environmental uh, challenges, environmental problems, uh, both in cities and in uh, rural areas. Um, uh, I, you live in Stellenbosch, which is a, uh, it's, it's a paradox because it's a wonderful place, very beautiful, but it's at the same time very unequal in terms of, for example, land ownership, uh, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, and um, and what, what what about the future? What, what do you think that? Are you optimistic about the reduction of inequality in South Africa or not? Uh, <laughs> uh, what do, the, what do you think what, that will happen then during the next uh, ten, 10 years or so? I know that it's difficult to predict, but uh, uh, <laughs> what can we learn from the past and uh, what can we expect for, for the future? <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Roldan, uh, for having given me the opportunity to appear in this uh, conversation. 
I find it uh, a very big honor to be given a um, chance by the International Society to have a discussion on uh, the role of environmental economics. And uh, before I forget, I also would like to thank Jen very much for providing a very good broad overview of the kind of environmental challenges that uh, currently have an impact on efficiency and sustainability of the natural resources sector. Uh, I also would like to mention that in addition to what uh, Jen has highlighted, I think it's also important to remember that uh, the problem of poaching and wildlife management in sub-Saharan Africa is very fundamental and it's, it's got a very serious implication for both social and environmental sustainability in the context of there is a lot of uh, local population reliance on the commons that are found in the wildlife areas. So I thought it will just be important to also highlight that as part of the common challenges we are trying to face in our continent. Now, uh, I know that uh, Roldan asked me specifically to comment on inequality in South Africa, its impact on natural resources management and its impact on environmental degradation, its impact on uh, so, uh, social welfare. I would like to take a broader view for the reason that uh, uh, we, I, I, I prepared for this interview with um, a bird's eye view of uh, how to think or how to interpret the environmental challenges and uh, what kind of role uh, training institutions could potentially play in trying to find a solution to these problems. And uh, I would like to view in inequality as one of the challenges that we can address within the broader context of training in the continent. So with that in mind, I would like to begin by observing that when you think about the environmental challenges that uh, Jen has presented, to the economist, we can associate them with a kind of choices that people make as individuals or as collectives. So when I think about the problems in forestry, when I think about the problems in wildlife, etc., uh, it's 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 very clear in my mind why individuals might be faced by a set of incentives that make them take environmentally degrading choices. And in the same way, when you look at the structure of incentives that face individuals in the context of a common, it's very, very clear why as a group, they end up making choices that collectively reduce the welfare of the group. So that is uh, the first thing I wanted to, uh, to, to put on the table. It's not that it's new information, but I'm using that as, as a backdrop to what I would like to discuss. And then secondly, I want to observe that environmental degradation also happens within certain institutional contexts. There are some institutions that are more likely to foster environmental degradation, and there are some other, for example, if I'm having institutions of market failure, externalities, public goods, asymmetric information, et cetera. It's a set of institutions that are likely to lead individuals to make choices that are not good for the environment. So it is my sense that to meet these challenges, we need to empower policymakers and stakeholders with tools that they can use to change the behavior of people acting as individuals 
or as groups, which brings me, uh, you have to bear with me, I'm a professor at the university, so <laughs> most of my contribution in this field will be the way, the kind of interactions I have uh, within academics, which brings me to the kind of opportunities for training in this area of specialization we have in Africa. And uh, I would like to observe that within the economics profession, there are three broad streams of specialization that address environmental issues. We have people who focus on environmental economics as a, as a sub-discipline of economics. We have people who focus on resource economics and we have people who focus on ecological economics. Now, uh, I want to mention at the outset that ecological economics is methodologically very pluralistic in comparison to environmental economics or resource economics that are firmly built on the neoclassical economics foundations. Now, for this reason, if you look at the Ecological Economics Journal, for example, you will find contributions from many people outside mainstream economics. And this is the reason why I want to observe from the outset that to the best of my knowledge, I do not know of a formal tertiary level institution in Africa that teaches ecological economics as a subject, where you have a big basket where economists can contribute, geographers can contribute, anthropologists can contribute, biologists can contribute, et cetera, et cetera. So ecological economics. Having said that, we have got many programs in Africa with a focus on either environmental economics, resource economics, or resource and environmental economics, both at the undergraduate or at the postgraduate level. I find this a very important contribution because a key topic we teach in this subject is what kind of incentives can we choose so as to make people acting as individuals or collectives can make choices that are consistent with good practice environmental management. So if you'll allow me, uh, I just wish to mention that within Sub-Saharan Africa, the Africa Economic Research Consortium has been running a master's level course and a PhD level course that focuses on agricultural and applied economics. And within agricultural and applied economics, there are many opportunities for training environmental economists and resource economists. But having said that, I still see an opportunity for developing expertise specifically in ecological economics. Beyond the training opportunities that are available at the AERC, most universities in Eastern and Southern Africa at the country levels have got training programs in agricultural economics. And within agricultural economics, they have got, they also offer training in environmental and natural resources economics at the undergraduate and postgraduate levels. And even in many economics departments, you see a course or two at a third year or fourth year level where there is a discussion of environmental economics and what kind of role it can contribute towards alleviating environmental problem. And with that broad overview in mind, I think it's possible to discuss how inequality, widening inequality, what has been the experience and how we see it going forward. I think I would like to end at that point and we can continue the discussion further. Thank you, Roldan. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, so um, for this very nice overview, about also about the role of, of education itself in reducing inequality. I, I, I really believe that, well, at least here in Brazil, for example, access to education is probably the most important factor 
determining social mobility, right? If people have access to education, they have a much much higher chances to uh, to have a higher income uh, later on, and uh, not only income but also access to decisions and uh, um, 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 power to influence, uh, you know, uh, the future. Um, so maybe we, we can talk a, a, bit, a bit more about that. What, what, what do you think is the role of universities, both in Kenya and, uh, and South Africa, in producing um, inequality? And I'm very cu curious about, about that. Uh, here in Brazil, for example, there has been major efforts to um, democratize access to universities, uh, especially during uh, progressive uh, governments. Uh, which is not the case of the current government, but uh, um, before the current government, there were uh, there was a large expansion of access to universities, and uh, and uh, many people who before did, didn't dream about you know getting to, into the university could finally uh, do it through different kind of policies like uh, 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 fellowships and quota systems and. Uh, expansion of the capacities of, of universities and so and um, and I think that's that's also a challenge both in in, in Kenya and South Africa. Um, and maybe we can talk uh, more specifically about that. I mean, what 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 do you think is whether universities are really achieving that goal of getting more. Uh, uh, um, uh, um, um, accessible by, by vulnerable social groups or, or not, what, what kind of progress have been made. And uh, that includes, of course, access to education in, in ecological economics and uh, uh, that's part of the, um, of the challenge. And I have, uh, as, as, as Eric said, um, institutional, uh, uh, I mean, educational and institutional issues that affect not only decisions about the environment, but also democratic decisions and um, and, and decisions regarding uh, um, collective action yeah, that, and, and in general, are, are very important. I think should be part of uh, any education system uh, in the world. Um, so maybe Jane, can can you comment on that? What 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 do you think it is? Uh, you work at the University of Nairobi, right? And what 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 are the main challenges you are facing to democratize access uh, to the university? Okay, uh, thank you, thank you. And uh, let me first say that I'm actually on leave uh, from the University of Nairobi. Uh, so that then I can uh, do more meaningful contribution where I am, but which is a capacity building organization, but uh, we build capacity uh, through uh, offering a support uh, in research, but very intensive uh, scientific mentorship and also uh, policy, policy engagement, mentorship in policy engagement for our grantees. Having said that, I want to pick up uh, from the question that you are asking and also picking up from the excellent uh, discussion that uh, Eric has just uh, 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 finalized and say that um, I think as uh, Eric has said first, when you think about uh, training in ecological economics. I know because of where he is from, he's talking more about environmental economics, but looking at it broadly, issues to do with the ecological economics, as we have said, uh, we, we don't have real structured um, training in, in, in ecological economics. I guess what happens is that uh, as students uh, take other uh, different uh, disciplines, as he has said, for instance, whether it's uh, agricultural, applied economics, and agricultural economics, whether it's environmental uh, economics, whether it's natural resource economics, uh, they tend to uh, bring in some other uh, kind of disciplines so that uh, the, multi uh, the multidisciplinarity of some of those co courses, including economics itself, uh, gender issues, anthropological issues, sometimes help people then when they come to research to be able to uh, focus on ecological 
issues. And uh, therefore, I would say that uh, going beyond the universities and I'll come to the universities, remember that there are also research institutions which in their own ways build a lot of capacity uh, through um, uh, supporting the research because it's at the research level that real issues of ecological economics can be uh, analyzed because at that level, you are able to maybe look at um, even an economic problem, but look at it from several spheres, whether it's environmental, whether it's social, whether it's gender, uh, whether it's cultural. Okay, right now I talked earlier about the environmental Kuznets car, but we are basically linking the environment with growth, for instance. And if we want to look at even maybe the, the gender implications, supposing we had data and we want to look at the gender implications of the environmental Kuznets curve, then maybe we would be going broader now from environmental or, 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 or environment and development economics to actually go to ecological economics. Okay, having said that, uh, what has happened, because I think your question is very general, uh, Rodan, is that uh, in our countries over time, actually university education has really expanded, even in Kenya. Uh, during our time when we were students uh, in the eight, uh, in, in the 90s and maybe be, before the eight before the 90s uh, and the year 2000, what we had as the university system in Kenya is very different from what was there before, now and after. Uh, what happened is that uh, actually, I think in the year towards the close of the 20th century, they, in Kenya, we introduced what we call self-sponsored programs. Before, there were very few private universities and the public universities that were there were limited. So most of the students actually used to go to study abroad, especially in India. There were a lot of Kenyan students who, who used to go and study in India. But um, come around 1999, the year 2000, the system opened for self-sponsored students who could actually join public universities. And that changed the, the game such that so many people then uh, got access to university education if they could afford. And uh, it's not limited, it's not uh, just economics, it could be natural resource economics, it could be environmental economics, depending on the universities. Uh, but I think now we, we did very well. I think we, I would say we plateaued because I think the government uh, at some point now has changed policy. Whereas people are paying for themselves to go to the university, even the government sponsored programs, the government has now actually reduced the funding so much, even to public universities, such that you find the institutions are struggling. It's like the government decided at some point that they, there is need to fund what we call uh, vocation, technical and vocational training Vets, and so reduced the budget for universities and started supporting the TVET institutions. I think over the last five years, Eric, if I'm not wrong, and uh, this has had, has had adverse maybe implications on uh, the, 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 the kind of support that is going uh, into the universities. Not, of course, to mention that there are other emerging problems that have come with time. Um, including the pandemic, because we know over the last two years, then even the, the ones that were relying on external funding, they have really strained. But yes, over that period, we opened up, uh, there were more opportunities for training, including in uh, ecological, maybe economics related, uh, but now it's no longer the case. The role of research institutions in furthering this discipline of ecological economics, I think cannot be overemphasized because that is where research takes place. And once that research takes place, it gives the research the, at the academicians, the opportunities to interact globally. That's how maybe I and Eric met in the first place. We've done many things together. We've both been part of the IP best uh, uh, um, uh, team uh, working on uh, documents. And we know all this is all ecological, uh, ecological, uh, ecological economics 
related. So I think that's um, uh, what I would want to say. But maybe uh, as I finish, I can also then say that uh, the African Society for Ecological Economics then is really trying to harness uh, this kind of uh, maybe opportunities uh, that we can think about, whether it's the people who are trained in environmental economics, natural resource economics, whether they have some ecological economics background, whether they are agricultural economics, applied economics, and then uh, together then with other uh, disciplines, whether it's uh, gender, anthropology, whether they are people who are working on legal issues, political scientists, political economists, we can actually come together, have a forum to interact together, uh, to actually uh, carry out research on environmental, I mean, environmental, natural resource, ecological economics, interact with policy makers, and ensure that we can make a difference in terms of policies in the region. Thank you. Let me stop there for now. Great, Jane. Thank you very much. And um, so maybe Eric can, can comment uh, briefly about um, yeah. what, what steps the Stellenbosch University has taken, for example, in the direction of okay. getting <laughs> more democratic access. And, <laughs> and also, I would like to ask you, because since you are a member of the board of International Society for Ecological Economics, Maybe you're, we are just starting it, right? Our term, <laughs> so <laughs> it's maybe too early, but um, uh, to ask you, uh, how, how do you think that the international society can promote uh, ecological economics in the, in the African continent? What kind of activities are, are necessary and how can we contribute, uh, collaborate with the, with the African society and what kind of, um, partnership we can develop between the international society and the, and the African society. Maybe both of you can comment that, but Eric can start. <laughs> Thank you very much, Holden. Uh, if you will allow me, I want uh, to refer to some experience I brought with me from the University of Pretoria, because I recently moved to Stellenbosch. Uh, this is my second semester since uh, moving to Stellenbosch, and I spent about 14 years at Pretoria. I just want to give you a sense of uh, the important role the university has played in trying to promote the objectives of environment, natural resources economics, ecological economics in the region. Now, uh, I, as a postdoc fellow, I worked on a project in Pretoria that was called the Natural Resources Accounting Project for Eastern and Southern Africa. Between, it, uh, that project ran from 2004 all the way to around 2010. And the aim of that project was to encourage greater policy use of natural resources accounts in the region, and this project covers country, covered countries in Southern Africa and in Eastern, in Eastern Africa. In particular, in, South, in Southern Africa, we worked in South Africa itself, in Namibia, and in Botswana, in Mozambique. Then in Eastern Africa, we worked in Uganda, in Tanzania, and in Ethiopia. And I have to say that the most important contribution of this project was we were working directly with policymakers, specifically encouraging, encouraging them to construct, to construct resource accounts and how these resource accounts could be combined with the standard national accounts to provide information about the performance of their resource stocks. So I could confidently say that during the time of the period, during the time of the project, we had a lot of policy interactions with different policymakers in these different countries. And uh, I can confidently say that in South Africa, at least in South Africa as, as a country, we had success in the sense that South Africa 
has institutionalized the construction of resource accounts. And even today, if you go to the national accounts section in South Africa, there is some very well-defined uh, responsibilities for resource accounting and the work of the environmental economist. And beyond constructing resource accounts and their policy use, we trained a lot of graduate level students in the discipline of resource and environmental economics, because during that period, we used to invite about 20 students from Eastern and Southern Africa to come and spend a semester in Pretoria, where we will teach them uh, advanced level courses in uh, resource economics, environmental valuation, et cetera, et cetera. And most of those students, we recently did um, a survey to see the impact of that kind of intervention. Most of those students are either working in research institutes or they are teaching environment and natural resources economics at some universities within the region. So to answer your question, uh, the university definitely has had a very important role to play in trying to, to, uh, to educate stakeholders and the public about resource economics and what it could potentially do in the context of uh, efficient resource use and sustainable development. Of course, and I, I, should, I should also be clear about this, the project I'm talking about was funded by CEDA Sweden. We also had some funding from CEDA Canada and I had uh, many very, very, very good colleagues who worked with me in that project to make it the success it was because we ended up publishing, having many publications and many policy applications. I have to mention that uh, I worked in that project with Professor Rashid Hassan, Professor Glenn Murray Lange, the late, all those, all those people at the Bayer Institute. If you remember Professor Mela, if you remember Professor Perings, all those, all those, Professor Dasgupta, it was, it was a project that really attracted international attention. And through that, we were able to do a lot of good things. Now, coming back to South Africa in particular, I should say that the, the government has proactively promoted the funding opportunities of formerly disadvantaged students to gain access to university education. I am new in Stellenbosch, but in Pretoria, I know for sure. There was some affirmative action and the government provided many opportunities for formerly disadvantaged students to study at the university. And by the time I left Pretoria, we had some very decent numbers of students who were studying agricultural economics environmental economics. So I think it would be very fair to say uh, public institutions are playing their roles. Of course, we are all experiencing a down on trend. As Jen said, funding to the universities has been reducing. The natural resources uh, program that I was uh, working on in Pretoria, the funding ended, but that is a phenomena that we are experiencing across the globe. But the point I'm making is the uh, uh, government has really gone out of its way to try to support and promote the growth of different disciplines, including environmental economics, both in country and the region. Thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot to both of you. It's, it's, um, it's a pity that we are closing to the, uh, close to the end. <laughs> This uh, cannot uh, also Jane had some uh, commitments and uh, <laughs> we are close to have a really one hour conversation. So uh, that's enough for, for one episode. I hope we will have other conversation in the future because uh, the topic is extremely interesting and uh, there are many things we could talk about. And, uh, and I think I also like that uh, we share many challenges and here in Latin America and, and Africa. And, um, and we have a very uh, similar countries in, in terms of uh, both uh, the cultural um, 
and, and ecological diversity and uh, and also many social challenges related to conflicts for example that Jane talked about and um, uh, and we also have a young population that is looking forward to have a better future so it's also our responsibility as uh, scholars you know to to provide education and to 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 give up hope né, for this young people that are our students and uh, so i would like to thank you again for being here and maybe uh, we can close with some final words from from jane and eric uh, just to to mm -hmm. To, to arrive to the end of the conversation. I hope the first conversation we have <laughs> of, many, of several more. Eric Sorry. can go, Eric can go first. Yeah, yeah, okay. you can go, Jane, if you want. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Jen. And thank you, Roldan. Thank you, Jen, for giving me the opportunity to go first. And thank you, Roldan, for the opportunity to present. Uh, to me, this was a very important opportunity uh, to to uh, to discuss the kind of challenges we are facing here in Africa, uh, insofar as uh, environmental problems are concerned, how to think about them and what can be done about them within the context of uh, best practice, in the sense that um, we are interacting with people at the at the international level. I just wish to say that uh, I never had the opportunity to discuss how the International Society for Ecological Economics could potentially support work on ecological economics in Africa. And it is for this reason that I am looking forward to the next interview opportunity where we'll get to thresh out this issue at a more refined level, because as far as I, I am concerned, there is a lot that the International Society and the African society could play to support, especially, especially gra uh, graduate students in developing an interest and producing quality work, work that can support policy in Africa. Thank you very much. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rodan, uh, for this opportunity again. And thank you, Eric, uh, for your uh, last parting shot. Uh, just to challenge you that uh, that's why now you are sitting in the board of the International Society for Ecological Economics, being a board member of the African Society, you are there to represent the interest of the African Society, and I will uh, leave it to you to push to ensure that the International Society uh, supports the African Society as much as possible. Having said that, I think my parting shot again is that um, I think we've discussed uh, very interesting issues. Uh, we need to have more on this uh, when we can, where we can come together and deliberate on uh, issues related to ecological economics uh, in Africa and maybe we relate to what is happening in Latin America and the rest of the world. Uh, but having said that, as the president of the African Society for Ecological Economics, uh, mine would be to urge all those who will be watching this uh, video uh, to know that the African Society is up and running. They can visit our website. Uh, they will be able to get details of how, if they are eligible, they can become members. Uh, if they are Africans, and if they are not, they can interest uh, others to join this uh, association so that uh, we can build better together and see uh, how we can um, further um, uh, reinvigorate uh, the society uh, to work towards a more sustain, uh, sustainable ecological um, uh, environment in Africa. Thank you. So thanks again to both of you. I'm really looking forward to, to work with you during these two, two years now that we'll be in the, in the board of International Society. And I'm, I'm really optimistic about uh, the things we can improve and, uh, and then the goals we can achieve together. So thanks again. 
and uh, yeah, I hope to see you soon again. <laughs>